Well, it is a joy to be gathered together with you this Christmas Eve night as we uh, look to uh, the story of Christmas, the most magnificent story really this, that's been told, that God would come into the world uh, to rescue his people. What a joy it is to be gathered with you, whether you're a member of New Life in Christ Church, whether you are a child who grew up here and is coming back with your parents, uh, whether you're visiting with a friend, whether you're joining us online, you know, what better message and story is there to take time in the reading of the story, in the singing of the carols, and now in the looking at God's word of what God did in that first Christmas. It is a joy to be gathered with you today. If you are visiting, uh, my name is Sean Whitenack. I'm one of the pastors here at New Life in Christ Church. And what I want to do tonight is focus on uh, a short section of what Pastor Sam uh, just mentioned there a minute ago. And that's out of Luke chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, where we read this. Luke chapter 2, 13 and 14, where we read, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Now around this time of year, as we come to the end of the year, modern dictionaries, they take some time to think of the word of the year. Oftentimes, that word of the year is, you know, if they came to their online site, how many people searched out that word or Google words or something like that. Miriam Webster this year picked the word gaslighting. Gaslighting is their word. I guess we've heard a lot of that over the last year. And I know this is not a formal definition, but gaslighting is that event where you manipulate someone uh, by thinking that they're crazy and you're in your right mind. Again, a gaslighting. Well, dictionary.com picked a different word. Uh, their word this year was woman. And I guess that there was a lot of people asking the question, what is a woman? And dictionary.com was the one provided that answer. That was the most searched word there. Um, Oxford, interestingly, chose the phrase goblin mode. Goblin mode as their 2022 word of the year. Um, it's a slang term often used in the expression in goblin mode or to go goblin mode. And it's a type of behavior which is unapologetically self-indulgent, lazy, slovenly, or greedy, typically in a way that rejects social norms or expectations. If any of you have raised teenagers, you know that every parent's job is to get them out of goblin mode, right? <laughs> All right, well, the word, though, that I want to focus on today is the one that was chosen by the Collins English Dictionary. And their word this year was permacrisis. Permacrisis. That was the 2020 word of the year. And just hearing it might help you uh, think about why it was chosen. It refers to an extended period of instability extended period of insecurity, especially one resulting from a series of catastrophic events. One person from the dictionary writes, to sum it up quite succinctly, it shows how truly awful 2022 has been for so many people. And another writer writes, permacrisis is a term that perfectly embodies the dizzying sense of lurching from one unprecedented event to another as we wonder bleakly what new horrors might be around the corner. Now, why do you think that they would pick this word? Well, even this year, uh, we do see that there was one crisis after another that we went from, from, from war to rising prices. Anyone felt that recently? To weather, anyone felt that recently? Or we have some good friends around the country are going through rolling blackouts over this um, weather storm. You know, that's a crisis, health problems that people have faced. There's been a lot. And then there are people who add fuel to the crisis, and why do people like adding fuel to the crisis? Well, because when there's a problem, there's also an opportunity for gain, isn't there? People in groups who take advantage of that. And it, even out those, we look outside of us, you know, we know inside of us, inside of our own lives, our own crises, financial, in our family, in our relationship uh, that we have with our own health, 
Uh, something happens and it just takes our attention and our energy. Uh, we can seem always to be in some sort of a crisis, whether it's something that's real or manufactured. Maybe you feel like you've been in a perma-crisis. When crisis hits, we wonder how we're going to make it through, don't we? And it brings us to our passage tonight, where we hear the angels say, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. That's the blessing that the angels brought as they spoke to the shepherds. So shepherds watched over their flocks by night as they announced the birth of the Savior, Jesus Christ, down in Bethlehem. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. This peace is important. Is that what we want out of a crisis? A restoration of peace? A solution to the crisis that's around us? A solution to the crisis that's in us? And here's the question we wrestle with. Why, why, with this promise of peace, given over 2,000 years ago, why do we still struggle to have peace? The Christmas song that really drew my attention this year, actually over this last week after a good conversation with someone, was the song, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. Someone told me that there was a movie that came out about this song this Christmas. Um, it's a story of, uh, you know, you can tell if the hymn has a story about it, a movie about it. It's got to have some, something behind it, right? You know, it's significant. There's something in it. But it really is the story of the angels and the words in Luke 2. This is how the, the hymn starts. It says, I heard the bells on Christmas Wild and sweet, the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. You know, it's a good start, but there's a, there's a dark twist to it. It was written by the greatest poet uh, in America in the mid-1800s, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. It was written at a time of national crisis during the Civil War. It was ripping apart the nation. It was written at a time of personal loss for him as well. His wife died in a tragic accident. His son was injured in the war. And he had his own personal health issue as he was badly injured in an accident. And he wrestled with it so much that he wrote a number of lines in the hymn, and one of them sticks with us to this day. He wrote, and in despair, in despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. So we may wonder the same thing as Longfellow asked as he wrote this, is there peace available? Can I have peace? How does this message affect me and our world? What do we make of this verse? Was it a blessing for nothing? And Jesus is called the, the Prince of Peace in Isaiah 9-7. Did he bring peace or not? And what about the, the perma-crisis that the world faces? Well, I want to point out a couple things from that passage in Luke chapter 2, verse 14. We see the peace that Christ brought into the world. Now, I know it's Christmas Eve, but I want to talk just really briefly about translations here. The translation that says, peace on earth, goodwill toward men, is probably not the best translation of what the angels said. It doesn't capture the full statement. And even if we may wonder about the, the, the best translation we might use, we know that the sense of it carries something more than what is often communicated. There's something that's left out in it. And I want you to hear again what was said in the passage I read. It was actually said, it says, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. And you can see where the blessing is applied. It is applied to those with whom God is well pleased. It's a directed blessing. It's not an indiscriminate thing. And here is where the blessing goes. The blessing of peace that's given there is given to those who seek God by faith, just as these shepherds would, as they'd go after Jesus. One reason that we become overcome in crisis is we're afraid for the future. We don't know how it's going to turn out. As we face the potential of suffering, of loss, of darkness, of conflict, 
Our fear amplifies that the crisis. We look to the uncertainty of our future. It robs us of our peace right now. If we, if we knew that everything would be okay, wouldn't that bring much more peace even when we face crisis? And even if you're here and you don't believe in God, you, you do have that sense that there's a lot of things that are outside of your control. We're going to talk about God a lot in it, but, but maybe you're here and you said, I don't know that I believe in God, but even you, you'd have a sense if you're here today that there are a lot of things that are outside of your control. And many people call it fate. Maybe people call it the universe. People call it, well, that's just life. Something else, but you know there's something that's outside of your control. And because there's something that's outside your power, that brings fear. You don't know what's going to happen. That's what we're afraid of, isn't it? We don't know what's going to happen. We want to know how to have peace. What happened on that first Christmas was a declaration that peace, peace with the greatest power in the universe, that that peace was possible. Peace with God was possible. How? How would peace with God be possible? Christmas is the declaration that God sent the Prince of Peace into the world. That Jesus Christ would bring peace to God's favored ones. That's what he came to do. To make peace between people and God. To take the threat of imminent uh, judgment, take away that, that threat of impending doom, the sense that God or the universe has something against us, and to deal with that. We all have a sense that something could go wrong. It's Part of that is just the knowledge that there's sin in the world. It's the knowledge that something is wrong in our world. It's the sense that something even is wrong with us. It's the knowledge that we have sinned against God. We have ignored his commands. We have rebelled against his authority. And the Bible's clear that sin alienates us from God. It, it puts us on his naughty list. And that is what produces anxiety. It steals peace. More than anything else, sin steals our peace. And that's the genuine crisis of every human soul. But it doesn't have to be permanent. When Jesus came into the world, he came to make peace between sinners and the God they'd sinned against. The thing that he came to solve was the conflict between man and God. People needed a mediator. They needed someone to stand in the middle. They needed someone to make peace. And that's what Jesus came to do. It wasn't to make a promise of a trouble-free life. It wasn't the cessation of international conflict. It wasn't a, a promise of ease or of no suffering, at least not yet. That's for heaven. That's the later of what he brings. But for the right now, then, what is it? Here's what it is. It's the promise that the troubles and the suffering, the difficulties that we face does not come to us because of this pleasure of God. It's not because of the displeasure of God. That's what Jesus is coming reminds us of. It's the removal of enmity and warfare between the sinner and God. Jesus came to make peace with him. And if that is gone, that enmity is gone, if we have peace with him, then we can truly have peace. At Christmas, we remember that God himself came in to make that peace. That's the real grace and the wonder and the kindness of Christmas is that God came in to make peace with those that had sinned against him. God knew there was a problem and he addressed it in humbling himself and coming into this world as a baby. He took on that conflict. He took on the sins of his people upon himself and he removed that very thing that brought the conflict. In order to do this, he had to come in to live a perfect life, to bear the sins of his people upon him. That's the, this is the beginning of his life that we talk about today. 
But by the end of the light, uh, by, the, by the end of his life, we know he would die on a cross to take away that sin. And he did that so that we could have peace with God. He can take away your sin. He can give you peace with God. He can take away the threat of loss and the threat of judgment and replace it with the promise of God's grace and his goodwill. That's the blessing of the angel. It brings up this question again. Who are the favored ones of God? Remember what the angel said? Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. With whom is God pleased? He is pleased with those who see they've sinned against him and ask Jesus to forgive their sins. Those who see the power of sin in their life and, and say, you know, I know this power is there. I want to follow Christ as my Lord. Christ is my Savior. Those are the ones that he favors. Remember that hymn that we spoke about earlier? I heard the bells of Christmas Day. Well, what happened after the verse, after that despair, after the hate, after the mockery that he sees, is there hope? I love how the song goes on. Then rang the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail with peace on earth. Goodwill to men. I mean, don't you love that? God is not dead, nor does he sleep. And Christmas is God starting his kingdom, where the wrong shall fail, the right prevail. I mean, that is the, the Christmas message to the world. It's a world of, I mean, this, this is a world of, of permanent crisis. There is something always going on somewhere. And how does the world experience peace? Well, peace in the world comes as a people of peace bring peace into the world. The lack of peace in the world is a lack of peace with God. But if you have peace with God, you can bring peace to others in the world. Has it been good for Christ to come into the world? You bet. As people of peace have come into the world, they brought peace with them. It has been good. It is transformative. But that peace comes in his own kingdom as those who follow Christ. Are you part of that blessing of peace? You could be one of those in whom God gives favor. It's not because they're so good. God's not picking some religious or pietistic elite people. No, all of us have sinned. You may have sinned greatly. That doesn't matter right now. Jesus was the Prince of Peace because only he qualified to have peace with God. Only he obeyed God's commands. All of us, the Bible says, have sinned. But he extends that peace to everyone who follows after him. It says to everyone who believed after his name. And so the question is, will you follow the Lord Jesus Christ? Will you ask him to forgive your sins that you can know the peace of God? To have, to have peace with God, you need to follow the Prince of Peace. You need an ongoing faith in Jesus. You need to know there is a conflict and Jesus came to bring that peace. He didn't just extend an olive branch. No, Jesus came to be a bridge in order to bring you over to God. But you go through him. We know the peace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. The blessing of peace comes to those who follow Christ by faith. That's what Romans chapter 5 verse 1 tells us. It says this, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, that means accepted, forgiven. We've been forgiven by faith. In Jesus Christ, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you have permacrisis in your life? Are you not dealing well with it? Do you want a peace with God? Believe in Jesus Christ. Do you want to know the peace, love, joy, and purpose of knowing him that he brings? Well, join with us in this. 
This is what the Church of Jesus Christ is all about. It's, it's not just individuals following Jesus. It's a group of people. It's a church, the body of Christ, following after him and spurring us on one another towards his calling of peace. And remember this, that as you believe in Jesus, what do you have? You have grace. You have favor. The angels have said it. The angels have declared it. If you believed in Christ, that's what you have. You have his love. And you know that whatever happens, that God has a purpose, a future, and a plan for you. He is building his kingdom of peace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, that first Christmas, you declared peace. God, you know our crisis. God, you know our hurts. God, you know our addictions, our darkness, our demons. God, you know it all, and you know how we want peace. Yeah, Lord, we have so often wanted peace without repentance. We've wanted peace without faith, and then we wonder why we don't give it, get it. God, we give that up. God, we know that peace will only come as we surrender our lives to follow after the Prince of Peace. Thank you, God, for sending Jesus into the world and dying for sinners. And Father, as we know that is our hope, help us bring that peace, the peace that we know, into the world. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, how does peace go out into the end of the world? Again, it's by knowing Jesus Christ. And if you take out your candles, you know, we're reminded as the candles are lit. How one person knows Jesus Christ, they share Christ, but together we burn brightly because that is what would bring peace into a world. It is to know him, to share him, and to shine brightly together as followers and disciples of Jesus Christ. So would you stand together, let's sing together, Silent Night, and our ushers will help us in the lighting of our candles. Today as we celebrate that light has come into the world, light that brings peace. Let's sing together. Thank you.